a Fitbit knockoff. Her son got this on sale or something and sent it out for a present. And we thought, oh, this is great because she's very active. And so this will, you know, do her heartbeat and and count her steps and, and stuff like that. It wasn't very expensive, but it had some really positive quality. So that we thought, great, we'll make the most of this. And we, But, you know, we tried to figure out how to get it set up. And it wasn't intuitive at all. And I, I'm pretty good with tech stuff. And so, um, but it just didn't make any sense. And then we, we pulled out the the little manual, the owner's guide thingy that came in, stuffed in the box. And the, like the, the print was minuscule. You had to like get a microscope to read the print. And then it was written in some country where they thought it was in English, right? Have you seen that? You know, so like it didn't make any sense at all. And so we worked on it. We tried to make it uh, make it set up for us and everything. And eventually we just gave up on the, the thing. It would have been great to have, but we just couldn't crack the code. And so we gave up and, and just said, threw it in a drawer and then Probably recently it got sent to DI or who knows what, you know. And I thought, that's a lot of how people experience the Bible, isn't it? Don't you think? Where, you know, we've seen how relevant it is, the timeless power of the Bible and how all the things that God can do in our lives through it. But a lot of people have tried to read it and they've opened it up and just got really frustrated with it because they couldn't figure out how it works. And they couldn't tap into the Bible's wisdom because they couldn't crack the code. And so eventually they quit through the Bible on a shelf somewhere. It's in a pile somewhere and, and just haven't tried to read it because it was a discouraging, frustrating experience for them. The irony is, is that in our culture today, we have more access to the Bible than anybody has ever had in the history of humanity. We have more Bible access. We have it in print. We have it on app on our phone. You can read it online. You can le- listen to an audio version of the Bible. There's a million different ways that we can access that. Whereas if you think back in history, <clears throat> before the Protestant Reformation, the Bible was only available in Latin and Greek, in, in what were dead language, scholarly languages. Before the printing press in the late 1400s, the Bible was just not accessible to anybody because to have a copy of the Bible, you had to copy it out by hand from an existing copy. And, you know, that's a long book. And so it took years to copy another copy of the Bible manuscript. So people just didn't have it. It was a luxury. And one of the great legacies of the Reformation 500 years ago was that the Bible was taken out of the exclusive domain of the religious professionals and it was translated into languages that people actually speak and put in the hands of ordinary people like like you and I. Now, North Korea's been in the news a lot lately, right? With the missile stuff, and now with the Olympics, the Winter Olympics happening on the Korean Peninsula. And as I was thinking about this, I realized that North Korea is ranked number one as the worst persecutor of Christians in the world. There's no country that persecutes Christians more severely and more seriously than North Korea does. And so in North Korea, it's illegal to own a Bible. You can't even own one. And so people try to smuggle Bibles in across the border at great risk, at great danger to themselves. And if you are caught with a Bible, you will go to prison in North Korea. Maybe 15 years, that's been a common uh, penalty that they've given. But in some cases, people have been executed there because they have... A Bible. And how ironic, because we have countless Bibles, right? We have, we have Bibles that we never open. We have Bibles that we never, lo- never use. We got stacks of Bibles uh, in our houses here and there. And, and, and we, don't, we, don't, we don't use them. And I think a big part of that really is that when people come to faith in Jesus, they hear about the Bible, they talk about it, but they just don't know what to do with the Bible. And so that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about how to get the most out of your Bible. Because you know, the Bible is not a magic charm, okay? It's not like you got to have one in every room, right? So when you walk by the Bible, you get like a boost of spiritual energy, right? A a vibe thing, you know? No, no, the Bible makes a difference when you read it and you learn what's in it and you put it into practice in your life. Now that may sound daunting to you, 
But I want to encourage you that ordinary Christians have been doing that for centuries. It's really more accessible than you might think. So we have this great treasure. We have all the things that God's going to do in our lives through His Word. Then how do we get the most out of our Bible? How do we see it apply to our lives? Because I want you to feel confident when you open the Bible. When you open, I don't want you to feel lost or confused. I want you to experience all the benefits that the Bible has for your life. The power and the wisdom of the Bible. But those take shape when we learn it and then we live it. And that's what we're going to talk about today, how to do that, how to learn it, how to live it in our lives. So what I want to do is give you five simple practices that will help you unlock the Bible in your life. Five simple things. And then with each of those, I want to also give you some practical ideas that you can actually do with each one of these things so that it becomes accessible to you. It becomes part of your your life. The first thing, if you want to get the most out of your Bible, number one is read it. Read it. That seems obvious, right? But I want to talk about how to do that. Now, now the Bible talks, when you open the pages, you, if you read through it, it talks a lot about listening to the Bible. It doesn't talk so much about reading because it's written in a culture that in many ways is preliterate, that they didn't have the literacy rate that we have today where everybody pretty much knows how to read, and they certainly didn't have access to personal copies of the Bible. Like I said, it took so much effort to make a copy of the Bible that people didn't have their own personal copy. But one person who did, so one person who had the Bible... And thus is a lot like us today in ancient history of Israel was the king. Israel's king had his own personal copy of the Bible. And so what the Bible says to him makes sense for us as well. Deuteronomy chapter 17. (coughs) When he sits on the throne as king, he must copy for himself this body of instruction on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priest. Okay, so you don't have to do that, thankfully. All right? You don't have to type out your own personal copy of the Bible because we have so many. But again, they didn't have that back then. But here's what he was supposed to do with it. He must always keep that copy with him and read it daily as long as he lives. And so for, for a person with access to God's Word, it says do two things with it. Keep it around, keep it handy, and number two, read it every day. And then as we read on in the next verse, it says that way... He will learn to fear the Lord his God by obeying all the terms of these instructions and decrees. And this regular reading will prevent him from becoming proud and acting as if he is above his fellow citizens. So here's three things that happen as a result of his daily reading the Bible. Number one, he's going to have the right attitude toward God, an attitude of fear or reverence. Number two, he's going to live the way God wants him to live. He's going to have uh, become obedient and honoring God. Number three, his heart's going to be aligned with God. This says it'll keep him from becoming proud. So his heart will be aligned with God's character. And then there's one more thing in the next verse. It says <clears throat> it will also prevent him from turning away from these commands in the smallest way. And so this daily reading is going to prevent spiritual shipwreck in his life. It'll keep him close to God. <clears throat> and that's not just for the king. That's for anybody who has access to the Bible, as we do today. So let me give you some insight into how to read the Bible, okay? So first of all, there's some attitude. There's an an approach. I want to encourage you to approach the Bible and reading it uh, carefully and attentively, seeking to really learn, to really understand. So, you know, we're not going to read the Bible the way we read People magazine or Sports Illustrated, okay? We're not going to read it just for entertainment or just casually, just to kind of, just to kind of um, give us some mind candy. We want to read it a little more attentively than that. And so think about something that's been important to you, meaningful to you, that you've really read because it mattered. Like, I thought about the time a few years ago, I rode my bike across the state of Utah and rode through a lot of middle of nowhere places. And so I got everything I could find on, that, on the subject of, of long-term you know, bike touring. And I read it, and I read it attentively because I didn't want to get out in the middle of nowhere Utah and not know how to fix my bike or not have the equipment that I needed. So I was reading really attentively because I knew it was going to make a difference for my life. That's how we want to read the Bible. But again, not just to understand it, not just to learn from it, but also I want to encourage you to read it 
with the expectation that you're going to meet God there, that you're going to hear from God. So it's not just words on a page. That it's God's letter to you. It's God's way of communicating His heart, His life to you. And so you so pray. When you open the Bible, before you start to read, pray. Ask God to give you a desire to read His Word. Ask God to illuminate your understanding for what you read. Come at it with a teachable attitude. Come at it with expectancy that God is going to meet you there. Now, some practical ideas. Four, four or five things. I, I just encourage you at different times to try reading it in different translations. Now, all of the modern translations are all accurate. They're all valid, but they use slightly different use of English. And so sometimes reading a different translation, if your mind's been in kind of a rut and you're kind of used to reading those words and you kind of skip over them a little bit, reading a different translation has a way that it can, it can like give you a fresh take on what you're reading. And so you don't have to go out and buy a, a bunch of Bibles, but if you have the YouVersion app on your phone, there's, uh, or a lot of the Bible online sites like Bible Gateway, there's access to all these different translations. It's a good idea to try reading a different translation once in a while. And then another thing that's really practical is I encourage you to use a Bible reading plan. And that's why we've invited you to do the 40-day Bible reading plan during this series to give you a taste of what it's like. And there's a lot of great reading plans out there. When you're done with this one, uh, PursueGod.org has some other reading plans. Or the Version app on your phone also has some great reading plans that are anywhere from a week to, to months long that cover different topics or different aspects of the Bible. Uh, before we started the current reading plan that we're doing together as a church, I just finished a reading plan that went through the uh, New Testament letters and the book of Acts. And so I did that on, on the Version app. And so re- use a reading plan. And then I encourage you practically to start with an achievable goal. Like, don't say, I'm going to read the Bible for an hour a day from now on. Because you're going to make it like one day. And that's going to be it. Even if, you, even if you have a great time of the day to read. So, so make it achievable. Make it practical. Say, I'm going to read the Bible seven minutes a day. I'm going to read one chapter a day. And, it, you know, as you get into it and you develop a habit, you can build and grow from there. But start with something that's achievable. And then ask questions as you read. That's going to help engage you. If you know how to ask some questions, you're asking, what am I seeing here? And as I read, I like to ask three questions. What am I seeing here about God? What am I seeing here about people? What am I seeing in this passage about life? And as I read that, that helps me to engage and think about it, get my wheels turning in my mind. I'm asking, then, what does it mean? And how does it speak to me? And then a lot of people find it advantageous to take some notes and write down some of the things that they're thinking about and that they're learning as they read that day. So the first thing is, is to read it. That might be a great goal for some of you. We're going to ask you to come away with maybe one next step at the end of this message, and maybe that's a great next step for you, is to to read more carefully, more uh, consistently uh, in your life, to read the Bible. But there's another one I want to introduce to you that might be new for some of you, and that is if you want to get the most out of your Bible, learn to meditate on it. Now, what I mean by that, you know, I don't mean like a Hindu monk or a Buddhist monk sitting in the lotus position, you know, on a mat, um, saying a mantra over and over again. So in the Asian culture, in the kind of the New Age culture, meditation is about emptying your mind. But biblically, when the Bible uses that word, it's talking about filling your mind, filling your mind specifically with the Word of God. You can see that in a lot of places in the Bible. Here's just one of them. Joshua chapter 1, Moses tells Joshua, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. So what's happening here is that Joshua is about to take on this huge responsibility. He's going to take Moses' place and lead the whole nation of Israel into the promised land to take up the inheritance that God had for them there. This was He's going to be like the president and the general of the army and all the rest rolled into one. It's a huge responsibility and it won't be easy. And so Moses here, thanks Dave. Moses is telling him, here's the key to your success. The key to your success is the Word of God. You've got to know it, 
and think about it and get it into your heart. So that's what meditation is. It's the next step from, from Bible reading because it's deliberately pondering that verse that I've read today. So throughout the day, whenever your mind is not occupied with a task or a conversation, then you can be mulling over uh, the words of Scripture. Now, why, do you, why should we do that? What's the value of it? Well, you know from experience that you can know something without really knowing something, right? You can read about it, you can study it, but when the moment comes, where is it? You know, it doesn't come, like I know a lot about, I've read a lot about conflict resolution, conflict management. When I'm in the middle of a conflict, it doesn't always come to me and I just act the way I always act. And so th- this is what happens with meditation is that it gets God's words more deeply down into my heart and into my head and it creates habits of thinking so these truths burrow more deeply into my inner soul. So for example, in Psalm 119 verse 11, it says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So he's thinking about temptation. You know, if temptation comes and it it presents a pretty face. But he's saying, you know, if you have God's word hidden in your heart, you've been mulling it over, you've been meditating, it's been reshaping the landscape of your thinking, then you have a ready resource to answer and to overcome the temptation when it comes. Now, two practical suggestions related to uh, reading your Bible. Again, we're talking about intentionally pondering and mulling over God's word. Number one, one thing you can do is you can turn that verse into prayer. So let's say you're reading along your daily Bible reading, a verse jumps out at you, you say, this is a verse I really want to think some more about, then you can turn it into prayer and praying it back to God. So for example, last week's memory verse was Psalm 19, verse 8. He says, the commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. And so you can pray that back to God. Say, God, you know, I need a lot of insight in my life right now. I need some insight into my marriage. I need some insight into work. And so, God, I want, to, I want you to make your commands clear to me right now. I trust you. I trust that you can do that. So please, so you, by turning it back into a prayer, then you're thinking more about that verse and its meaning. And another way to do that is to think through the verse word by word and focus on each key word or key idea and dwell on the meaning of that. It could be prayerly, prayerfully, or it could just be thinking about and meditating about that word. So the commands of the Lord are clear. Commands. Yes, God does have commands. God does have a way that we're supposed to live that's going to be good for us. I'm thinking about his commands. What are some commands of God that I know in my life right now? And so in my mind, I'm thinking about, okay, the commands of the Lord. You know, he is Lord. Is he really Lord in my life? Do I treat him like Lord? Do I obey him? Do I give him authority over everything in my life? The commands of the Lord are clear. Okay, God, I'm going to trust you that, that everything that you want me to know is going to be uh, clear to me. It's, you're going to make it clear to me. Giving insight. God, I need your insight. I need insight for this, that, and the other, for living. And say, so you're thinking about this verse. It's about living. It's about life. It's not just about, you know, the abstract. But so this is, you know, this conversation is happening in your own mind as you're mulling over key word by key word of that verse. And so all day long, it is an opportunity to kind of percolate down into your soul. Now, to meditate on God's word throughout the day, it helps if you also, number three, if you learn to memorize it. <clears throat> Memorization used to be highly valued in our culture. I don't know what they do in school today. I don't remember my kids necessarily memorizing very much. I remember I memorized stuff as a kid in fifth grade. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. I memorized that in fifth grade. Right, so we all memorize. We all know how to do it because you probably have in your head a phone number that you don't have anymore, but you still remember it. You, do you remember the, the address of the house that you grew up in? 14128 Cameron Lane, Santa Ana, California, 92705. Like sometimes I got, can I not remember that, please, God? You know? You memorize the stats of your favorite athlete. You memorize the, you know, all the episodes of The Office. Um, so we, we have the capacity to memorize. What if we were to memorize something that really matters in life? So in Proverbs chapter 7, you know, the Proverbs is written all about encouraging us to live with God's wisdom and to take God's truth and put it into practice in our lives. 
to these, these great truths of wisdom. And so in light of that, he says, Obey my commands and live. Guard my instructions as you guard your own eyes. Tie them on your fingers as a reminder and write them deep within your heart. So he says, you know, these truths are so life-changing, then you should do whatever it takes to remember them. He says, tie it on your finger. You know, find some device or find some gimmick to help you remember because you want to write these truths deep in your heart because of their power to change your life. So how to memorize? It's pretty simple, really. You just choose a verse, maybe that spoke to you in your reading that day, or maybe a verse that applies directly to a situation that you're at in life. You know, maybe there is a temptation that you want to do better at overcoming, or maybe you just need encouragement, so you're going to memorize a verse about how great God is, or a promise of God. Whatever it might be, you choose the verse, and then you just keep it nearby. Like I use the Notes app on my phone, dictate it in there, and it's always right there, because I always have my phone with me most of the time. Or if you're old school, you write it on a 3 by 5 card or on a, on a sticky note, and you put a copy on your fridge or a copy by the mirror you look at every morning or a copy by your, <clears throat> by your computer monitor so that it's always handy. And then you just review it phrase by phrase until you get it. One phrase at a time. You don't try to swallow the whole elephant. Just one phrase at a time. You just keep reviewing it when you have a spare minute every day for a week or for a month until you've got it. The point is not to cram a bunch of memory verses into your head. We're not going to give you a gold star for that. But the point is to have it handy, to use it, to meditate on it, to help you with the situations that you face. And to be honest, we spend a lot of life waiting, don't we? You spend a lot of time waiting in the line to check out. You spend time waiting in the doctor's office. You spend time in front of your computer waiting for tech support to call you back or whatever. You know, why don't we turn that waiting time into gold by using it to review memory verses in the Bible that we want to, to learn. And if you have partners, it's easier with your family, your small group, with your friends. And so reading, meditating, memorizing, these are all things we can do. We don't need any special tools for that. We just need to have a Bible and open it and use it. But I want to take it one step further with our fourth idea today. To get the most out of your Bible, I want to encourage you also to study it study it. Now, a lot of these ideas overlap a lot. Reading, studying, memorizing, meditating. Yeah, there's some, a lot of overlap. But when I talk about studying, I'm talking about making a more careful and deliberate effort than just reading it, okay? Digging in a little bit deeper, examining the details, uh, thinking about the meaning, thinking more carefully about how it fits into the whole Bible. There's a lot of examples in Scripture of people who are serious about studying God's Word. Here's just one in Acts chapter 17. <clears throat> the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica, and they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. So Paul and Silas came to this town of Berea in ancient Greece, and the people there were receptive, they were open-minded, but they're not so open-minded that they were naive, that they would just believe anything that anybody said. But instead it says they searched the Scriptures, they looked things up, they studied it day in, day out to test whether the things that they were hearing were really true. And likewise, you're going to have times in your life where you need to test some things that people are saying to you. Or you're going to need to know more, you're going to need to study something from all the angles. If you're mentoring somebody, they're going to have a question that you don't know how to answer. That's a time to study. Or you're going to be facing a major issue in your own life. I mean, I remember my wife, Nancy, when she got sick with cancer, I remember thinking, I just really need to get in my Bible and really study and learn what God has to say about suffering and what he has to say about healing. Because that was personal. I have a brother who's homosexual. And over the last few years, I've, I've realized I need to really get in the Bible and learn and understand what God says about that, not just what culture or even Christian culture says about that, but I need to learn not just for some abstract knowledge, but because this is part of my family. This is personal to me. You might have an issue like that. Or you become confused about what people are saying because there's so many different voices saying so many different things about life 
and you need to weigh it for yourself. Those are various situations that might call for more serious study of the Bible. So let's talk about how to do that a little bit. You can study a passage. And maybe you read that chapter and you really want to dig in deeper about what that chapter means. Or you can study a topic and look at all the, the whole scope of what the Bible says about that topic. <clears throat> now, I'm blessed with a lot of, a lot of tools because I have a couple of rental properties. And so I use different tools for different things. I remember growing up, my dad was pretty handy, but his philosophy of tools was get a bigger hammer. And so I've noticed, though, that as you watch a craftsman work, that there's a, you know, there's a reason why they create these tools. And you watch a craftsman, he's using just the right tool for the exact job. And so my philosophy has become this. You know, that job's a great excuse to get a new tool, right? Well, there's some, the same thing applies to Bible study. There's some great tools out there. Each one has a particular niche and a particular purpose that's going to help you understand the Bible more. I want to introduce you to a couple of them. There's outside tools. There's things like a Bible commentary. That's what I have right here. This is a commentary on the whole New Testament. And so you could get a, uh, one, one book that Bible scholars and experts have written and you open it up and they explain what's going on in, in those verses and the next verses and the next verses. And so that's helpful um, to get some ideas on what that verse might mean. And these are available not just in print, but online as well. Lots of great Bible tools online. This is a Bible dictionary. It has great pictures, by the way. So that's, that works for me. Um, but this is alphabetical. And so you open it up uh, and you say, I want to find out more about the Garden of Eden. So I open it up to E, Gar Eden, Garden of. And it tells me kind of everything the Bible says about the Garden of Eden. So you have a topic in mind, you, you can look it up. Those are great tools, <clears throat> outside tools. And there's online tools. But it's kind of a combination here. This is a tool called eSword. And I really recommend this. This is available as a download. This is old school because it's got the CD. But this is available as a download. And it has some of those commentaries. It has some of those aids in there. But it also has a whole searchable concordance of the whole Bible. And there's other tools online. A Bible Gateway is one. Bible.com is one. That you can just search the whole Bible with a, with a click. You type a word into the, into the search box. Like I typed the word study into Bible Gateway. And it brought up a list of all the places that that uh, translation uses the word study or other words related to it. So I could get a, a larger scope of things. And then one thing that I would really encourage you to consider if you want to go uh, more into Bible study is to get a study Bible itself. Okay, a study Bible is has a lot of these tools like printed right in it. So it's going to have, at, like at the bottom of the page, it's got the Bible, but at the bottom of the page, it's got all the footnote. It's got the commentary notes. And so here I can see what it says about verse 33. It explains verse 35, and it goes on from there. But it also has at the beginning of every book a introduction to that book to tell you what this book is all about. Prophet Jeremiah, what's it all about? When was it written? Gives you an outline. And in the back, it might have a topical index, some maps, things like that. So this is a really helpful tool if you just want can uh, get one tool, check out a study Bible. But I just want to encourage you to start exploring some of these things, exploring some of the ones that are available for free online or that are available for a, a reasonably cost a download and start acquiring some good ones because that's going to help you to understand your Bible better. Now, there is a danger of Bible study. We said reading, meditating, memorizing, studying. Bible study has a, a unique danger associated with it that the other things really don't have. And that is that you can gain truth, you can fill your mind full of all these things you're learning, but never let it change your life. Right? So we have this myth in our culture that the more I learn, the more I learn more and more Bible, that that can automatically make me more and more mature. That's not necessarily true. There are lots of Bible scholars out there with PhDs in biblical studies who are teaching at universities, they know tons of more about the Bible than I'll ever know, but they don't even know God. And so, to get the most out of the Bible, we don't just read it, memorize it, study it, but 
finally, we also have to apply it, to apply it to our lives. So far, we've talked a lot about learning the Bible. But really, we, we can't be complete until we also talk about living the Bible. Those two have to go hand in hand. And we've seen how powerful the Bible can be. Then how do we experience its benefits? Well, this critical factor, this non-negotiable factor that's essential is that you put what you learn into practice in your life. I don't care how much you know if you don't put it into practice in your life. It's not going to have life-transforming power. So let's take a look at this verse. This last verse, James chapter 1, verse 22. He says, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourself. He says, if you reduce the Bible to an intellectual exercise, he says, if you read the Bible and then you walk away and you don't do anything with what you read, he says, you're committing an act of massive self-deception. You're fooling yourself. Now, we're going to talk about this more next week, this idea of application. But for today, just simply realize this, that the Bible only changes your life when you live what you learn. Got to learn it. Then you put it into practice. And I could give you many, many examples, but we'll talk about it again more next week. Now, there's always going to be obstacles that will stand in the way of you reading your Bible time and energy and understanding. And there's so many different things that are, that are going to put hurdles in our path. So one last thing I just want to encourage you, one resource that's going to really help you if you want to grow in this area is to connect with a community of other Christ followers. There's in tr- incredible value when you read and you study and you apply the Bible with other Christians together. And that's why we've encouraged you in this series to get involved in a small group, at least for these five weeks of the series. And if you have been involved in a small group, then you've probably been discovering how other Christians can help you in this journey of unlocking the Bible in your life. Can help you make sure that you're understanding things correctly, that you're putting it into practice, learning from one another. So we encourage you to connect with community as you as you live this out. Now, I realize I've just given you a ton of information and a ton of tools. I realize that, that you're not going to be able to apply this all at once. We don't expect you to. So what I do want to do is encourage you to take just one practical step today. Take one thing that you've heard today to focus on and then just go for that. Okay, so you might say, you know, yeah, I'm going to set a reading goal. I want to read more consistently, or I want to read with more insight and more more attention. So I'm going to set a reading goal. I want to do a reading plan or whatever it might be. Or maybe your goal is to say, I'm going to memorize the Bible because there's this issue that I'm facing in my life. It would be great if I just had God's Word in my mind, and I'm going to memorize a verse that speaks to that in my life. That would be a great goal. Or for you, your goal might be to meditate. You say, man, I read the Bible pretty consistently, but then I get to work and I get busy and I don't remember anything that I read. So the great step for you would be to meditate. And so you've got that, you're taking time, maybe you set a timer on on your phone. Or you take time at lunch to say, I'm just going to mull over and think about what I've learned, one verse from the Bible. Or maybe a great next step for you will be to study because there's an issue that you're facing in your life, you need to comprehend what God has to say. But whatever your next step is, I just want to encourage you to experiment a little bit, try some different approaches. You know, don't lock in on one thing, but but give yourself some space to learn and grow in this area. But whatever step you take next, then put what you read and what you learn into practice in your life. And I encourage you to share that next step with someone else. Share it with your group, share it with your family, and then let them encourage you along the way to tell them how it's going and how God is working in your life through that, okay? So let's do a Bible memory verse together. James 1, verse 22. I'm still working on this one. But I was talking to the people in kids' church. They do a lot of Bible memory, and they told me, you've got to put motions with it. You guys ready for that? I promise you the motions will be pretty low key, right? Okay, so let's try it this way. We're going to break this one into three phrases. Phrase number one, don't just listen to God's word. That's easy, just do this, right? Don't just listen to God's word. 
All right, let's say that together, can you? Don't just listen to God's word, okay? And the second phrase, he says, you must do what it says. So here's what I came up with. You must do what it says, all right? So, ready? You must do what it says, all right? Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Okay, now, I see, I don't have this yet. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself, right? Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. Like, you're crazy, right? Okay, so let's try it. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. Good job, you guys. You guys are way more engaged in motion than the Layton campus is. But I think I totally embarrassed them, okay? So you just learned a good Bible verse. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for how you're at work in our lives. Thank you for this great resource you've given to us in your word and all the things that it can do. Now, God, we want to learn how to get the most out of it in our lives. And so we pray, Father God, I pray just, God, that you put on each one of our hearts a next step of reading or memorizing or meditating or studying. What is the next step that you want us to do? God, we trust you for your leading, but we need your power. Because, God, you know how, how we've done so often in our lives that we've committed ourselves to a new resolution. And then after a few days, we've petered out. So we just really need your power, God. And we need to hook up with partners and friends who can help us. So I pray, Father, you'd make that possible for us today. And, God, we ask that you'd help us to figure out how to put it into practice in our lives. We're trusting you to lead. We're trusting you, God, to do amazing things through your word. We come expectantly to read. We come expectantly. We come teachably, Father, to hear your voice and to meet with you. And so do your work, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name for his honor and glory. Amen.